Good morning. I come from a country where things go missing a lot. In the last 50 years, we've lost some $500 billion from oil revenues. Sometimes ship, airplanes, and even at the time, our president went missing in Saudi Arabia for five months. It is the reason why my favorite musician, Fela Nicola Bokuti, refers to my country, Nigeria, as BBC. Not BBC News, but Big Blind Country. But some events happened, as you must have heard, in April. First, Nigeria's economy was recalculated, rebased, and recalibrated to become the first and the biggest economy in Africa, surpassing South Africa. And you know in Nigeria, anytime we have little good news, we go out to party. So Nigerian officials, apart from orchestrating this news as global news, sent out invitation letters for everybody to come to Abuja to party about our new economic milestone. But you know, as the invitation letters were going out, events have a way of smashing up against each other. A group of militants arrived a secondary school in northeastern Nigeria, in a place called Chibok. Went to the school where students were taking final exams and abducted over 250 girls. The Nigerian government, unwilling to deal with this rude interruption of the party in progress, said, well, the abductions were carried out as a result of Everywhere you go, Nigeria follows you. Um, yeah. That's some epileptic power supply affecting my microphone. Uh, so unwilling to deal with this rude interruption, of course, the Nigerian government said this abduction was concocted to disrupt the party in progress. That is the celebration of our eco -math mathematical milestone. And of course, some people even said it was meant to taint the reputation of the Nigerian president, good luck, Jonathan. So it fell upon those of us in the social media sector, new reporters, to report accurately that these girls had been abducted because the military had issued out a memo that the girls had been released. This is how the situation of Nigeria has been because some 15 years after the end of military rule, a once vibrate, vibrant Nigeria media had compromised itself to the point that it lent itself as mercenary to the corrupt and authoritarian causes in Nigeria. That was why in 2006, I started Sahara Reporters as a citizen's media platform. And the idea is very simple, is to use everybody who is willing to liberate themselves from the clutches of a media that went into remission by itself to report news instantaneously and accurately in a way that empowers them. So what did we do? We decided that we'll let the world know what's happening out of Nigeria with the girls. And the reporting we did at that time forced the condition of the girls that have been abducted, who, by the way, are still in abduction as we speak, to be recognized as a prime time event around the world and brought about tons of hashtag that is now known as bring back our girls. The girls have not been found, but we were able to force the global community to focus on their condition and hopefully we will find them. And what does this tell us? It is to make people understand that the power of the media has shifted, the narrative of telling the stories, of the context of stories in different parts of the world, in countries around the world, especially in Africa, has shifted by way of the work we do. And regardless of what anybody tells you, citizen journalism works, because you probably have seen the mainstream media people saying, no, citizen journalism doesn't work. An example is the man behind me. His name is James Onanefe Ibori. He used to be a cashier at Wikis in London, and had been involved in petty stealing but somehow he was able to forge a new passport and went back to Nigeria 
and found himself politically in power again after he left London. And with finding himself in power, a thief never stops stealing. They just graduate. So he looted the economy of the state, one of Nigeria's richest oil states known as Delta State. And with that, he was able to go back to the same London and buy pricey properties. He bought luxurious cars, even bought a private jet, and had the jet waited, I mean, the jet delivered by two weeks late because he wanted iPod jacks installed on every seat. He wanted to capture his own technological moment. That's how thieves are. And with that, before he could get this Bombardier jet delivered to him, the asset had been frozen by a London court. Ibori is sitting today in jail in the UK, sentenced 13 years to jail because of efforts of citizen reporters like us. How did that happen? It was because a Nigerian citizen who walked with us went to his garage in London and found a Bentley sitting down there, never having been driven, took a picture of it, and that gave the whole country the connection between the corruption that has been ravaging and bringing poverty to them and what Mr. Ibori did. All right? But the sad part, and this is what is important, is that while Mr. Ibori is sitting down in jail in London or somewhere in the UK, the banks that helped him loot the economy of his state were not sanctioned or punished. People ask me also about a situation in Nigeria recently where one of our ministers raided the treasury of an aviation agency and bought two BMW cars, BIMA as you call them, armored car, for twice the price that he ought to have bought them for. And her efforts, well, must have contributed to the air crashes you hear about in Nigeria. But what happened? Somebody used a cell phone to take the pictures of the invoices and sent to us. We published it, and this woman was exposed. But her expose that led to a lot of campaign in the country did not lead us anywhere until we found out that she has an MBA on her CV in a university in the U.S. that did not exist. <laughs> and she also has a PhD from another university in the U.S. that had closed down. Eventually, street protests, legislative inquiries forced President Goodluck Jonathan to fire Ms. Odu. And it's the first time in a long time anybody was fired for corruption in Nigeria. It happened in this year, February. We also do other things, like monitoring election. In 2007, we obtained the results of the presidential election 24 hours before the election held. It's only in Nigeria that that can happen, <laughs> right? So other questions that people ask me is how do you verify your information? How do you decide which news to publish? And how are you sure that your breaking news will not be wrong? I'll tell you that all of it is based on community. We have an army of citizens journalists who are using devices that are available to them to change the way business is done, and that provides instantaneous evidence. And I tell you that the kind of journalism we do has given Africa at least two revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, and a near revolution in Nigeria where in 2012, Nigerians rose up against the government in what we call Occupy Nigeria. That struggle, Occupy Nigeria, led to the arrest and prosecution of the oil cabal that had been stealing oil subsidies made for ordinary people. In 2000, by 2012, they had stolen $6.8 billion worth of oil subsidy, and Occupy Nigeria forced the Nigeria president to arrest and start to prosecute them. Don't ask me where the prosecution went, but we did our part. And we do such mundane things as following the president around and ensuring that we know the size of his delegation to the United Nations, which is the biggest in the world. Um, we help to expose police corruption, police brutality, and we do so using photos, texts, and videos interactively to empower people. And I must say something to you, that one of the things that bedevils reporting about Africa is how Africa is portrayed. And you know, Africa has become a victim of this caricature portrayal in the international media. And people ask me the same question. In reporting corruption, are you not also portraying Africa in a flattering way? And the answer is very simple, that Africa has a reality that we must deal with. And it includes good and bad things. 
and what this moment has given us, a technological moment where people can use their devices to report it. What I'm saying is that Africans should take control of telling their own stories. And it is up to them how they tell their own stories, whether it is good or it is bad. And I'll say one last thing to all of you, that internet is the best thing that has happened to humanity in recent times. But just like every innovation, internet is going through three stages. It's going through almost completed the stage of innovation. It is now going through almost completely the stage of imitation. And you must use it to further your democratic purposes before it goes through the last stage when the idiots will try to burn it down. Thank you for listening. morning. I come from a country where things go missing a lot. In the last 50 years, we've lost some $500 billion from oil revenues. Sometimes sheep, airplanes, and even at the time, our president went missing in Saudi Arabia for five months. It is the reason why my favorite musician, Fela Nicola Pokuti refers to my country, Nigeria, as BBC. Not BBC News, but Big Blind Country. But some events happened, as you must have heard, in April. First, Nigeria's economy was recalculated, rebased, and recalibrated to become the first and the biggest economy in Africa, surpassing South Africa. And you know, in Nigeria, anytime we have little good news, we go out to party. So Nigerian officials, apart from orchestrating this news as global news, sent out invitation letters for everybody to come to Abuja to party about our new economic milestone. But you know, as the invitation letters were going out, events have a way of smashing up against each other. A group of militants arrived in secondary school in North Eastern Nigeria, in a place called Chibok, went to the school where students were taking final exams and abducted over 250 girls. The Nigerian government, unwilling to deal with this rude interruption of the party in progress, said, well, the abductions were carried out as a result of Everywhere you go, Nigeria follows you. Uh, yeah. That's some epileptic power supply affecting my microphone. Uh, so unwilling to deal with this rude interruption, of course, the Nigerian government said this abduction was concocted to disrupt the party in progress. That is the celebration of our equal mat mathematical milestone. And of course, some people even said it was meant to taint the reputation of the Nigerian president, good luck, Jonathan. So it fell upon those of us in the social media sector, new reporters, to report accurately that these girls had been abducted because the military had issued out a memo that the girls had been released. This is how the situation of Nigeria has been because some 15 years after the end of military rule, a once vibrant, vibrant Nigeria media had compromised itself to the point that it lent itself as mercenary to the corrupt and authoritarian causes in Nigeria. That was why in 2006, I started Sahara Reporters as a citizen's media platform. And the idea is very simple, is to use everybody who is willing to liberate themselves from the clutches of a media that went into remission by itself to report news instantaneously and accurately in a way that empowers them. So what did we do? 
we decided that we'll let the world know what's happening out of Nigeria with the girls. And the reporting we did at that time forced the condition of the girls that have been abducted, who, by the way, are still in abduction as we speak, to be recognized as a primetime event around the world and brought about tons of hashtags.